what we found the best responders, the, the most naturally muscular people don't necessarily have the highest serum testosterone levels. Yep. They have the highest level of androgen receptors. Um, I, I want to like just clarify a statement that you had mentioned, Kurt, because you said, you know, at 1400 nanogram per deciliter, like you won't leverage anabolic processes. I, I, I think uh, we're talking about like what might be in, within a reference range. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think you disagree with what what Dean had said, that it depends like physiological yes. normal exposure yeah. would depend on yes. what that person's been used to. Correct. Right. So moving that needle up beyond maybe for that person, a thousand is like, man, they're a whole new yes. man. Uh, while others, it, it wouldn't be the case. Right. Correct. Well, medicine is based on averages, right? We can't, we can't tailor yeah. everything, but within that, that's what clinical practice should be. It should be based on standard of care is based on the individual. So again, let's say Dean comes to me, it, he could be hypogonadal, but have no symptoms. You don't necessarily have to treat it unless there's obvious, right? Issues. You also, you see guys that have a 600 test that have horrible symptoms. It just depends yeah. on the person. And that's where seeing a real doctor helps over, you know, sometimes some of these, you know, shady clinics or whatever, or trying to die. The other one I see nowadays is guys trying to diagnose and fix their own medical problems themselves, right? They, they do everything on their own and they're trying to interpret blood work. Then they're trying to manage other health issues that come along, right? Now they got high blood pressure. Now they got kidney problems. Now they got all these things and they're buying all these drugs in the black market and they're trying to manage their entire health without, you know, they're 20 years short of school to make that decision on how to fix those things. You know, playing nephrologist is, is not an easy job. No. You know, it's true. tough as an I earlier do. on user, right? Being like young, like myself, and I didn't have the money to run all of these these tests and meet with doctors and have like say a great clinic like like Merrick Health to like manage my health markers. Essentially, yes, you have all those things, but I think that's part of the initial realization is that it's going to be a costly endeavor and make sure you can at least afford. I, and, and honestly, labs are so cheap now. Like, yeah. I think probably all of us have some type of code we give out for lab work where we are, you know, adequately evaluating labs because I see a lot of guys will be like, hey, my labs are still good. Can I keep pushing? And they're missing like most of the markers that you should probably have on there <laughs> to check. You're like, yeah, that's not everything you need. And also lab work doesn't mean there's not still risk there. But uh, I think, you know, having at least understanding like, hey, every 10 to 12 weeks, you should be pulling some serum lab work in your analysis. Like this is cost that you should probably be thinking about. Yeah. And yeah, if factor you know that into your cycle. Design. And if you're young, like John said, and you just don't know where to go, right? Or you don't have a doctor that you trust. I mean, all four of us, I don't know if you still do consultations, but the, the, the three of us at least do. And there's there's probably, you know, at least 10 other guys out there that I would trust interpreting blood work. There, there are resources now that weren't available when I was younger, yeah. right? That, no, and I, I get agree. it, you're nervous to go to your, your GP, your family doctor and be like, I'm on test and DECA and I don't feel great, you know? Yeah, when well, you're young, you're maybe a little bit short on finance. I mean, you're probably- No, I get it, but- Yeah, you're short on finance, but, but you're, you you're, you're fat on time. So you can do a lot of research already, learn as you go along, but also ask your questions very direct so you know exactly how to get those answers for a 10 minute, 20 minute consultation. Because, you know, preparation into a consultation or even with a coach, I think that's half the work when you're young, you know, when you're short on money. Um, because then you can get the most out of a personalized service. Um, I think that's very valuable. To uh, to bring it back to blood work, like blood work every, every three months, every month, you know, depending on the level of your bodybuilding. And personally, I do it every month. Um, and I've been doing that for many years. I did it every year since I was 15 um, because I just wanted to know. So I literally have graphs of my testosterone levels declining until I was 26 years old. Wow. Yeah, then I, I mean, my levels were 620 nanograms per deciliter, so it's not terribly low. But, you know, after 11 years of 90 bodybuilding, I wanted to see what one ampule of testosterone was going to do with me. And I, I gained uh, like 15 pounds in five weeks. And yes. that, yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah. And Gains. then I started dieting. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of gains. Um, so, but a, a lot of guys, they, they don't really do that. But I think nowadays there's no real excuse anymore with the reef. I mean, we, all four of us are basically excellent resources of information. Um, and I think if you just follow through for the first four years, five years before you start your first cycle, you're close to as much of an expert you can be on testosterone because in the time that you're not training and cooking meals and, and ordering supplements online, you can do some research on testosterone only, and you know exactly what to expect on your first cycle. Now, if you do blood work a couple of times, I don't see a problem with running testosterone only for a year straight. 
right? Yeah. Maybe assuming you do some ACG for testicular yeah. function, maybe two years. But there will come a point in time where Pandora's box is now appealing. And then what we're going to add? Yeah. Wait, can if I just... If I had a time machine, I would add growth hormone. But Kurt, yeah. I'm sure I, I was just going to back up to just what John said about Dean's comment. So what we find in natural individuals, and it probably carries over to drug enhanced, when we're talking about what amount gets you over a certain serum level with your own biochemistry, what we found the best responders, the, the most naturally muscular people don't necessarily have the highest serum testosterone levels. Yeah. They have the highest level of androgen receptors. So their AR density is naturally much higher than someone who's not going to respond, right? And we see that even in guys that use drugs, right? I'm sure we've all worked with people who have, you push the limits of the, the gear up a little bit and nothing really occurs, right? That's generally an AR issue um, or some other polymorphism or other gene, but it's not so much the serum, but we can't measure, I, I can't necessarily measure someone's androgen receptor density that, you know, yeah, it's not like a practical test you're doing on people all the time. So we go by serum level. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. It does just depends. It's an in, in, in individual thing, not so much. You know, I think when you start this first cycle, you absolutely should be seeing on a week to week basis the ability to increase load reps every single session, nearly across every single exercise. Yeah. I think if you're not seeing that, then likely your dosing could be inadequate, or you still just really suck at programming your training and, and, and doing <laughs> those things. So, yeah. I, I think whether your increased dosage, it should always be that questioning process and assessment. So if the dose is too high, like, hey, do you have all the following check, like adequate sleep, like you have a low stress, nutrition's on point, trainings at adequate volume and effort. Um, are you in a calorie surplus and gaining weight? Like if you're not gaining weight and you're not eating enough, well, yeah, the gear's probably not gonna be taking this full advantage and you're probably not seeing training performance increase. Now, if you're doing all those things and training performance is still not increasing or slowing down, this might be the assessment point to it is time to increase the dosage. But before that, it's like, yeah, hey, what about health risk and markers? Like, are those in check? Yes, or is steps like within that risk profile? Okay, now we make the decision, yes, it is time to push up the dosage. And that's kind of where you might fall along the spectrum like Steve's bring up that I, I very well think you could run a testosterone only cycle for a year without having to adjust dosages back down and just have this continued slow escalation using that assessment along the way which absolutely I think holding dosages for at least eight weeks at a time would be very reasonable for esters to accumulate. You hold that peak dosage for a time, you look at labs, you make your next decision from there. And I do think a 20 to 30% increase milligram wise total per week is very reasonable to keep moving that needle. So this might be 70 milligram increase of testosterone at a time. And of course that percentage would build upon. So you keep leveraging the same amount of growth as you get more advanced. And by the end of a year of doing this, you very well could end up in that 500 milligram of testosterone point. Yeah. You might not because you can tolerate, you reach this point of where you have to make a decision of, hey, this estrogen issues are becoming problematic. You could go the AI route and build testosterone up that way, or you might need to leverage some other type of compound and build it up that way. Got a two decisions to go, but I think within that dosage profile for your first three, you make tremendous gains and you wouldn't have rationale to really need to be pulling back the dosage and just really milk everything out. Yeah. I like that you said 500 milligrams after a year. A lot of people mm -hmm. are going to be pissed, which is what the anabolic ground table is about. We're, we're here to break hearts. <laughs> I was going to do that in 12 weeks and then I lose my gains and then I do PCT and <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Bring that LH and FSH up and then you end up looking exactly the same. Uh, as you did at week zero. Dean, anything uh, you would want to contribute? No, I think we've, we've touched on it quite a lot. And, you know, the resounding thing that we keep coming back to is training, is being able to train effectively and efficiently. And I think, I guess we were all lucky. We probably grew up in a period where there was no social media of like confounding biases to training. We all understood like DC, top set, back off set, go in and annihilate yourself, which... Yeah, we've we've discussed now several times that we've probably leveraged anabolics to overcome recovery issues from that type of training. But now we're like falling into the pattern of, you know, single arm cable exercises of like nail and execution there where you're losing the focus on load, on tension, on technique. 
that. We're doing uh, we're doing uh, high level exercises to sculpt the physique, which is already there, to build a physique that is still under development. So you're basically trying to ride a sports car when you're six years old. Yep. You, you need to you learn know, how to ride a bicycle first. Um, and like what and we've discussed, you know, about high volume approaches, reps and reserve. You know, most of us have been training way over you know 15 years that we're now getting to more nuanced ways of staying injury free more than trying to gain muscle tissue specifically. So even at that training that John touched on, you touched on, before you even like assess your next move of anabolics, you need to be looking at your training and really having a an honest you know assessment of your train intensity. Like you said, you you could be training legs three times per week. Most people I know if they train legs properly you'd be lucky to get back into the gym after five days. So, you know, that, that real honest assessment of your training progress alongside your dosage increase and then food on top, that's quite often the, the missing puzzle piece. I'm, I'm eating correctly, I'm taking the gear, but then you're not training properly. So the physique isn't adapting to that training stimulus. I will say that based, purely based on social media, I think people take their training a lot more serious now because it's a bit of a badge of honor than we used to do back in the day because we couldn't mm. share our training videos, right? So when I look, John, uh, look at John Train or myself or some of the other people that I follow on social media, everybody's training very deliberate. Um, and, and that seems to occur at a much younger age as well because they get exposed to it. Now, does that qualify them to start cycling earlier? I'm not entirely sure, but that also seems to be the norm now where people don't start at 25 where their brain is fully developed, but maybe 23, 21, 18. Then again, I went to school with classmates who started their cycle at 16. So, you know, has it really changed? Uh, they they went into their parents at the animal jar that they got from Thailand, by the way. But that's a story for a different subject. 